What's up, Hill Country Church? Can you hear me without the mic? It's supposed to be on. There it is. What's up, guys? It is so good to see y'all this morning. Just want to go ahead and invite you in. We are going to get ready to praise and worship the King. We're going to fix our eyes on Him this morning, and we're going to encounter Him, right? Because when we put ourselves out there and we come to meet Him without fail, without a doubt, He is going to meet you just where you are, okay? He will never, ever, ever disappoint those that call on Him. Okay, so this morning I want to read um, John 14, 27. The Lord just put it on my heart for our service this morning. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Okay, this morning or this week I was going through some stuff with my septic system and things aren't looking good, people. <laughs> but it's going to be okay, right? right? And I, I was worrying and I was having a hard time and Timothy was helping me through it and my wife was helping me through it. And they were just like, why are you like, don't worry. Why are you worrying about this stuff? Like God's got it. And the moment that I just realized that they were right and I chose to stop putting my faith in the problem and to look at Jesus square in the face, I knew that he had me and I knew that it was okay. So I wanna challenge you guys today that this peace that Jesus said that he's going to leave with us is a guarantee. It's not something that we have to conjure up on our own. And what we do to partner with him in that is we fix our attention on God. Psalm 141 says that we have eyes only for him. We yeah. only have eyes for God. We only have eyes for him. Okay, so I wanna challenge us all this morning to do whatever you need to do to set your focus and to set your attention on the Lord. Okay, that always seems super abstract to me personally. I never knew what to do, but every time that I choose to do it, that I choose to focus on him, he meets me exactly where I am. Okay, so let's pray together. God, thank you so much for bringing us here. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for who you are. I release your peace in this place. I release everyone's receptors to be able to just be open to what you're saying, God. And right now, as a church body, we set our focus on you. Give us eyes only for you. We are here to worship you. We are here to love you. And when we look at you, when we fix our eyes on you, every other problem goes away. Every other problem goes away. We refuse to give our attention to anything that's not you, Jesus. Amen. Guys, so get up here. Let's worship the King together. Let's fix our focus. Let's fix our gaze. Wait, nobody moved. Come on, let's worship. Come on, I'm not kidding. Come on, let's worship the King. Let's worship the King. Come on, get out of your seats. Fix your attention. Make a choice. Make a choice to fix your eyes on Him. You can fix your legs on the front too. It's the same thing. Let's go, guys. Thank you so much.
Let the wind blow. Let the tide roll. To the earth knows. You're a God of love. Let my dry bones sing a new song.
You're the God of love. Oh, you're the God of love, love, love. You are, you are. All glory to the God of love. Oh, he's better than we know. Let the whole You're the God of love. You're the God of love. You're the God of love. You are, you are the God of love. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, you are. Yes, Jesus. Yes, yes. Jesus. Thank you.
shout with our hands raised to heaven. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> if it's kneeling in reverence or it's dancing with joy, we'll sing songs never ending. We love to bring you praise. in the room right now and and I don't want anyone to miss it 
There's a place where God is literally taking off heaviness off of us. How you know that it says that the patterns of this world are trying to put heaviness on us, but he says that take off the spirit of heaviness and put on a garment of praise. And it was like we were just reaching in to what is ours in heaven. And so I really want to encourage you right now, even if this is not your personality or your flavor or whatever you want to call it, because I know some of you are going to be watching football in a little bit. And it goes beyond personality and flavor, come on, even come if your on. team is losing or yelling. Come on, come and so on. I just really want to encourage you right now. We're going to go back into that. And, and I believe this, that the Lord has something for you. Now, I'm going to say it again. The Lord has something for you, and it's freedom, and it, but he won't, he, he won't just throw it on you. He wants you to raise, raise your hand and to take hold of it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back into this, and I just encourage you, don't be an observer. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it looks like for you to not be an observer. If it's clapping your hands for the first time, then let it be clapping your hands. If it's moving around a little, then move around a little. If it's dancing, dance. But I encourage you, let it be praise, okay?
begin to lift up your praise to him right now. Use your own voice. Just open your mouth. Let out a song to the Lord. Oh, praise, praise. He's worthy of our praise. Let everything, let everything that has breath praise. Stand up, hey. Pray. 
let's just surrender and raise our hands up to the Lord. Yes. Whatever you want, have your way, Lord. I will make a room for you to do whatever you want to. Whatever you want to, yes, I will make a room. To do whatever you want to have your way. I will make room for you, for you. To do whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to, yes. I will make room. This is my worship. This is my holy offering. This is my honor. I love, I love to please my loving King. This is my worship. This is my holy offering. This is my honor. up our voices to you in worship. We lift our hearts to you as an offering to please you, Lord. We just say more, Lord. More, 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 more. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us up to overflowing. We thank you. We declare you are our King and you are worth everything. You are worth everything. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and transition into our time of communion together. So I'd like to invite the, the deacons up. If you are a believer in Jesus today, we invite you to partake in his body.
order to do that, we're going to divide you guys on either side. Come out your aisle, come down and go around. And then I'll invite who is doing communion up and we'll take communion together. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Glory in the highest. He's come to save us. Come to set us free. That's why we're doing communion this morning. We fix our eyes on you, Jesus. The one who came to save us. This is Jesus. The one who gave his life. Glory in the highest. He's come to save us, come to set us free. Oh, sing Hosanna. 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 Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Good, good. Whoa. Good morning. 
Right, I get the privilege this morning of taking a communion together with us. And so uh, just as, as, as I was praying, uh, preparing for communion this morning, uh, just a story actually came from, uh, on my heart. And it was actually a conversation I was having with um, uh, with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, we were talking and, you know, I asked, you know, hey, how's everything going? He goes, oh, man, you know, just I'm here earning my salvation. And uh, I chuckled a little bit and I felt horrible after that. And he was like, why'd you chuckle? I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm glad, man, salvation is not about us. It's, it's not on us. Yeah. It's, we can't earn our salvation. He already has. Yes. Good thing it's not on us. And so um, and it just it, it, and it was stirring my heart this morning because whenever I was thinking about communion, that's what communion is all about. It's remembering not about what we have done, but about what he has already done for us. Because it's through his finished work on the cross that we are actually able to not have salvation through him. It's not about what we do, but it's actually about what he has already done for us. Yes, and so through the, bre- through the bread and the blood purifying us, um, that's what this is all about here. It's the act of remembrance. That's what Luke talks about, say in, in Luke 22, about how do, say when Jesus commands, do this in remembrance of me. And so as we kind of go, so as we get started this morning here with the bread, you can go and have the bread in your hands. Luke 22, 17, after taking in the cup, he gave thanks. This is Jesus. Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again until the fruit of the vine, I say, uh, fruit of the vine, until the, the, until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, for this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if we go ahead and take the bread this morning. Jesus then continued and took the cup. And the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, for this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take this in remembrance of me. So go ahead and take the wine. I really just felt to encourage you guys this morning as we do this act of remembrance, that especially if it's been stirring on your heart, if it's been just something that you feel like it's been striving for in terms of like, man, I don't know if I can actually earn my salvation here. These things here, this last supper, it's the act of remembrance of it. It's not about what we can do. It's about what Jesus has actually already done for us. And so we say we bless you guys in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm really excited. I'll tell you why I'm excited. Because I know God's going to do something amazing. He's always doing something amazing, but I tell you, He's going to do something amazing today. I can feel it, and uh, there's just confirmation after confirmation. My kids, when they give me a birthday card or a Father's Day card sometimes, they, they write second best dad. And something in, me, <laughs> something in me feels like, that's not fair. But, but it's actually very true. I am the second best dad. Our best dad is our God, our Father in heaven, and he is a good dad. I wanted to start with this verse here. Nope, that was a text message. All right, this verse here. Okay, we're here, we're here, and it's a good one. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good, good, good things to those who ask Him? How good is that? How good is that verse? We're all His kids. We get to be His kids and we get to ask Him. And so, you know, when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I felt Holy Spirit just gave me this quick image. I'm going to just tell you this real quick. When you start surfing, there's a thing called the crash zone. And the crash zone is not where you want to be when you start surfing. It's quite scary, particularly if the swell's big, the waves just land on you and land on you. And the thing I teach my kids, or I teach anyone, is don't panic. When people panic in that zone, they try to fight it and you get worn out, or they even try to quickly turn and try to catch something and then it just smashes them and smashes them and away they go. 
And the interesting thing about that image where I felt what Holy Spirit was showing me was actually, you know, what our Father is trying to say is, guys, like even when there's trials, even when there's financial hardship, when there's things going on, like I'm a good dad, don't panic. And we've got a great testimony. I'm gonna invite Adam up here, he's gonna share. Let's go, Adam. Hey, what's up, everybody? <clears throat> okay, so I wrote it out. Um, I don't do a lot of public speaking, so here we go. Uh, so I wanna share a quick testimony about how God continues to provide and protect our family because we trust Him with, with tithing and we trust Him with um, Him providing for us. So um, over the last six months, I was feeling like I needed a new job and, and start to work at a new company. So I uh, started sending out my application and I sent it out to a lot of places, but only heard back from a few. But through those few, God opened the door and provided a new job for me and it came with a higher salary. So, so as if that's not enough of a, wow, God, that's so awesome moment. There's more to the story. I started my job last Monday, so that was my first, first day, and then on Friday that week, or this last Friday, unfortunately, I found out that the previous company that I was at had to lay off most of the people working there, and I would have been most likely one of those people. So I was just blown away at, like, God's protection. Come on. So, so as I was processing this during the week, I was reminded that when we tithe and trust God with our finances, He promises to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much Come blessing on. that there will not be enough room to store it. Come so on. through this testimony, if you are needing a new job, needing a raise at your current job, or if Come you on. have another financial need as you trust God with your finances, I am believing that God will do it again. Come on! Wow, awesome. How about that? So we're not gonna stop there. He is God, he is good, he is Jesus. So. As Adam just shared, if you're in need of a new job, if you are looking for even pay rises, if there's a financial situation in your life and you wanna see that shift, there is no lack in kingdom, therefore there's no Come lack on. in this house, there's no lack for us as his kids. So I want you to stand and we're gonna declare and we're gonna pray over this situation. Here we go. Yeah, all right, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, we just thank you for you for your goodness. We just thank you that you are provided. We thank you your kingdom lacks nothing. I just pray over every single person who've just stood now and we say breakthrough to their finances, Father. We declare new jobs. We declare pay rises. A shift in financial circumstances. We thank you and we declare in your name, in Jesus' powerful name. Thank you, Father God. Amen. We are called to be like our Father, who overflows in generosity. He's invited us to be cheerful givers, so we can live in His blessings and abound in all things. Let's partner with heaven today and joyfully give our tithes and offerings. Here's a quick link to visit the giving page on our website, providing you with multiple ways to give. There are also offering boxes with envelopes to drop your cash and checks in the back of the sanctuary. May you be blessed as you give, believing that God is faithful to supply all your needs.
Good morning. Oh, goodness. Are we in a good mood this morning? Come on. I, I was in the same worship set you guys were, right? That was amazing. Um, all right, kids, zero to sixth grade are dismissed out that door. Parents, you can get them checked in the kiosk. All of our adults, if we can make our way to our seats. You know, I visited a farm this week. It was a good time. And they had chickens. And I realized something. Chicken coops always have two doors. And I said, that must be so it's not a chicken sedan. So, uh, yeah, a chicken sedan. Uh, now I'm just thinking about chickens trying to drive. All right. Uh, you're welcome. All right. Where's our silver saints this morning, our legacy makers? There they are. Our legacy makers are going to have um, lunch together next Sunday, um, and it's going to be right after church. Oh, goodness me. Uh, we went techno. All right. Um, right after church, um, over in our cafeteria, you can see Doris and Elmer for more information, but be sure to go out to the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet there to sign up and bring a dish, um, just a time of, of fellowship, of talking about the Lord, and of course, breaking bread together. So, all right. Uh, and then tonight, we are having, if you don't know, we have our second Sunday. It's exactly what it sounds like, the second Sunday of the month. We always come back in the evening just to do a little double dip, right? And who likes a little double dip? There we go. Um, and this is perfect because tonight's a worship night. Let's get back into that praise we got into this morning. Amen. Um, just a powerful time of it. Um, so we'll see you tonight at 6 p.m. Come join us for that. And then today, right after service, we have our intro hour. So you, if you are new with us, uh, if you're looking for a place to connect, this is a good way to put it. If you don't know who you sit with yet, um, then maybe, maybe it's time to go to intro hour. It's right after service in our Narnia room. Just go out this door and to your left. And there's snacks and, and child care provided. And it is the one thing where we say it's an hour and we really do keep it to an hour. Tim's excellent at that part. Uh, and so, a little joke there. Um, so it's, a, it's just a brief time to t chat with our senior leaders, Tim and Elizabeth, about the church's history, learn some of their personal history, um, our core values and vision, and it's uh, the next step. You've already shown up, but it's the next step of just um, going further in with Hill Country um, and learning maybe there's just a place God has for you, whether a connection group, a ministry to uh, volunteer in. So come see us right after church. And finally, something new. You guys ready for something new? Sit with me? All right. So perfect Sunday to introduce this. Adam and Danny killed it, didn't they? Um, with, um, with Okay, two people. Um, um, Addie and, Adam and Danny killed it with the offering this morning, right? How powerful was that testimony? And so um, we are going to be doing something. It's our intro to financial health on Saturday, the 28th of September from 10 a.m. to noon. You're going to be with our senior leaders, Tim and Elizabeth, as well as, as Nathan and Melissa Runacres, who are right there. Hi, guys. Um, and it's to discuss God's plan for wisdom and practicality with money because God wants us to be good stewards and live in abundance. Amen. Um, all right. Um, the rest of you, we should, uh, I, let's, let's, let's make the decision right now. Lack or abundance. Who's going to choose abundance in the Lord? Amen. Uh, come on. Um, so this is just going deep into that of what God's word says of testimonies, um, and just, to make sure that we're living in financial health. I think Tim's going to share a bit more about it. So without further ado, will y'all welcome Tim as he comes up to share this morning. All right. Hey, let me just share about that 10 to 12, 10 to 12. I'm getting yelled at from the front row, 10 to 12. Actually, what I want to share is what God is, what is doing. One of the things he's doing, how I many know Jesus can do a lot of things at the same time? Scripture says, uh, one thing he said, two things I've heard. I just hope that freaks you out a little. Uh, because we've put him in the really small box, but he can do whatever he wants. And one of the things that he's doing is we've been a church for like 52 years, coming up on 52 years. And there's things that happen, like in church plants, you, you get to create culture. In churches that have been going a while, you get to repair culture. And, and I felt like the, as we've been talking as a leadership, we've been talking a lot about abundance in our core team eldership meetings. What's it look like to live in abundance? And finance is something that has actually not been talked about much here. Even though we want you to give, we want you to be blessed. So we talk about giving, but we want to talk about like, what's it look like to have healthy finance and wealth? Oh, see, I knew it'd get a little more dicey when we talked about wealth. 
but the scripture is full about wealth. And if you're, if you're calling me a prosperity preacher because I'm talking about money, well, we believe in prosperity. So if that's what you want to label us, label us that. But the key to it is God wants you to have health and wealth. And he's, but he's got to get us healthy because have you learned he doesn't give you anything that you'll drop to the ground? He is passionate about the things of the kingdom and things of heaven. And so he wants us to build, he wants to build something in us that we hold it. And so we're going to talk about health, but we're also going to talk about wealth, where we're going to talk about what does it look like to have a wealthy spirit and a wealthy bank account. See, it, I knew it would take a minute, but that's what has to happen in here because if we don't embrace that, we'll live in lack, not even knowing it. Because we're actually saying, well, money's not important. And just from the roots of this house, there was declarations that money wasn't important. And I believe that God is wanting to reset the standard in the house. He's wanting to say, no, money Money is, is part of the kingdom, and, and the only fear of money is the love of it. He never says money is evil. He says the love of money is evil. So we'll talk a little bit about that on Saturday and how to reject those kind of thoughts so that you can actually let the seed of the kingdom and the seed of finance grow at the same time together. So, hey, can we have a tiny bit of fun for just a second? I'm going to preach here. But last night, Chad and Michelle Holman texted me from San Francisco because they're 49er fans. And, and then I found myself just celebrating them and what they're going to do. They're going to the Monday night game. And I thought of the scripture in Matthew 6 that says, love your enemy. It says, even the world loves those who love them. So my declaration to all you non-cowboy fans is I love you. And the scripture tells me to love you. But to you cowboy fans, thank you for the declaration and the example of undying hope. So I warn you, I have a jersey that I have purchased for Super Bowl Sunday. And in faith, I see that and say, I will wear that only when we reach the Super Bowl. It's a little dusty. So, but Romans 5 tells me hope doesn't disappoint. So I got to keep hoping. Amen. And to... Uh, to my lone Texas fan back there. You've got a man of God as your quarterback, so I can celebrate you. All right. If we can't have fun, I mean, Isaiah and I have a little running, uh, I would say, battle going on. So he wears the Eagles jersey in here, and it challenges my love for him. And then he's mouthy on top of that. And the Lord says, I always bring one to sharpen you. So it's NFL season, can you tell? All right, I hope you can have fun a little bit. I hope you can understand that the scripture, Jesus, when he was talking, was having fun with his disciples. So what I want to do, I want to take the next 30 minutes, and I just want to talk about I want to talk about the best thing about Jesus is Jesus still. But I want to talk about it, and I want to give you, because we've been going a while, and sometimes you can forget the why. You know, we're, we're deep into Mark now, and, and like, what are we doing? And, and I, I was thinking about, because we were talking in our, our core team meeting about, like, what's the dream of this house? What's God's dream for this house? And I got to thinking that dreams and dream fulfillment, I don't mean like night dreams, How many of you have a desire for something in your heart that you're like, I know God has put this in me? The rest of you, Chris doesn't have one. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Well, you were already back to this position when I looked. So, uh, but I, I want to talk about that, that. That's actually God's model. He dreams things, and then he, he puts dreams in us. He dreams things, and then he fulfills them. It's a model of the kingdom. And I want to read you a crazy verse, because I believe there's dreams in all of us, and I'm going to talk about God's dream for us for a second. But listen to this in Ephesians 3.20 in the Passion. It says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceeding your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power consistently energizes you. And I actually believe that dream and dream fulfillment are an energy creator in the kingdom. He's wanting to create energy for the journey, for the run, and he's saying, hey, this is how I do it. I put things in you, and then I fulfill them. And it actually says that in John that answered prayer is the fulfillment of joy. It actually creates joy in our lives. So he's saying, hey, I want to do something amazing. I want to put dreams in you, and not all of them are just about your destiny. It could be you dream for your children. You dream for your family. You dream, I dream for the city. Like, what's it look like to live with the burning tattoo on your heart that San Marcos shall be saved. Like the whole city, our whole city. See, we, we've lived with like, man, I hope this room gets filled. I don't hope this room gets filled. I hope we can't fill them in, fit them in this room. I want to meet in the field. That's where I want to meet. And I want it to be San Marcos shall be saved and not for our own glory. Like if no one ever knows our name, but they know Jesus in this place, then that's all that matters. And that's a dream, right? But the father had a dream, and I want to talk about that for just a second because the father's dream was crazy. He was like, hey, here's my dream. I want to be in relationship with my children. But I wrote this, my image bearers. I want to be in relationship. Now, let me just tell you what relationship is not. It is not religious activity and it is not information. Do you know that you can have a ton of information about God and do a lot of religious activity and not know him at all? And he's the father came that we, he created us. I think about the garden and I'm like, man, one day I was kind of lamenting. I was like, man, I wish I could be the garden. He said, you can. Just go there because you have full access, because I tore the veil. See, he fulfilled the dream. The dream, the enemy tried to stop God's dream, and God said, yeah, I'm going to show you. And Jesus came and tore the veil and said, now you're back in relationship. You're back in closeness. But I, I think about this, and then I got to thinking about relationship and how we talk about it a lot without a lot of definition. Like, what does relationship with Jesus look like? Like, I feel like oftentimes we use phrases and we don't define them well enough. And that's one of my goals this year is like, I want to define what we're talking about because we use a lot of words that people don't know. But I relationship with God, which is relationship with the Father, relationship with the Son, and relationship with the Holy Spirit is connection with them. It's exactly what we teach our young couples when they're going into premarital. Your pursuit is connection with one another. It will be tempted and attacked by the devil, and how you respond will be, I choose connection. The other fact is, is it's intimacy, and instead of using some weird word that people have all messed up, let's just use it real simple and almost embarrassing, into me you see. And to me, you see. So God's saying, I want to be intimate with you, so I'm going to let you look into me. But guess what that in turn does? Then he says, now I want to be intimate with you, and I want to look into you. Yes. 
and I want to know you, and I want you to know me, and I want this. That's the dream of the Father. That's why he created us. So what's that have to do with Jesus? Everything. See, Galatians 4.9, can you just throw that up there for me? It says this, it says, hey, that we would be known by him and know him. Or it says that now that we know him, or rather, is that what it says up there? Or rather, being known by God. The bigger one is that you're known by God. But the wild thing is then you get to know the creator of the universe. And that's God's heart. It's the dream. Heaven had a dream, and and the devil knew it. That's why he attacked it. Think about it. I want to give you a little context. God was saying, we're going to create these people, my people, they're going to bear my image. No other being in the universe is going to bear my image. Only man. And my dream is to walk and talk with them, to do life with them, connect with them. My dream is to watch them establish my kingdom. My dream is them to look like me, talk like me, act like me in their own individuality. And so why am I talking about this to preface where we're going with Jesus? Because Jesus said this amazing thing in John 17, 26. He said, Father, I'm gonna, I don't want to mess it up. I have made you known to them. The role of Jesus when he came the first time was to make the Father known to us. He wanted to show back to the dream. The Father has a dream He wants to be with you. It's not about bulls and goats. It's not about blood and sacrifice. It's not about the temple. It's not all the things that offended him and they killed him for. He said, none of it's about that. It's about the father's dream to be with you. And that's what, why we're going through Mark is so that we can have this revelation of what's Jesus telling us about himself, about the father, and about the Holy Spirit. He's saying, into me you see. That's what the scripture is. It's God pulling back and saying, into me you see. You want to know who I am? Here I am. Can you email your face that that was good? (laughs) Games aren't on yet. You got seven minutes. No phones. He's saying, come on, into me you see. And Jesus is showing, let me just tell you, and we never arrive. Because he's infinite, first of all. But also, I think about Apollos in Acts 18, 18, it's saying, hey, we met Apollos. He was accurately teaching about Jesus, but there was something he didn't know. He was accurately teaching about Jesus, so it wasn't an indictment of where he was at. He was saying there was more, and Paul just said, and then we taught him the more. And by the way, that was the Holy Spirit. So what was happening? Apollos, a lover of Jesus, a pursuer of Jesus, all of a sudden there was a spot he didn't know about Jesus, and, and Paul said, oh, let me into him, you see. And Paul, And then Apollos becomes one of the early fathers of the early church. We only have a few scriptures about him, but he was because he was humble enough to say, no, I'm right. He said, okay, tell me more. So I pray that we carry the spirit of Apollos in here this morning. As we look at Jesus again and Mark, and like, oh, we're talking about Mark. We're talking about Jesus. Come on. We're talking about Mark. We're talking about Jesus. And we have so much theological teaching that has to do with everything except Jesus. And it's why we're messy. Because it's not into me, you see, where God is saying it. It's into the preacher, you see. Well, that was free. All right, so turn to Mark 7. My dream for you today that you would continue to have revelation of Jesus and to live in deep connection with him. That's my dream. That's my dream for this church. That's the dream for the city. Honestly, it's the dream for the whole world for me. Everyone would get to know this Jesus that I know. And then they would look into him and see he's good. 
So, all right, Mark 7, y'all there? 31, it says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Ty and Siren, down to the Sea of Galilee, into the region of Decapolis, means 10 cities. That's our region. That's what I call it. We're, we're a bunch of cities put together. Then there's some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on them. After, the, after he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. That's weird. He looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh, he said, yeah, be open. That's Aramaic. Don't pretend you speak Aramaic. At this, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loose, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. Remember, no secret disciples. People were amazed, overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. It's another glimpse of God saying, into me you see. Into me you see. You want to see who I am? Jesus, let's show them who I am. And so I, I wrote three things down. You can write them down because if I don't get to them here, you at least, no, I will get to the last one. It's fire. There's no need to beg. Say, well, it worked. It doesn't mean it was right. What I want to teach you there is you don't have to do everything perfectly for the Father to respond. Number two, he removes us out of the atmosphere of our pain and disappointment to bring us into healing. And number three, he does everything Beautiful. Honestly, if we could just live in those three points this week, we would live in righteousness, peace, and joy. We would live in fullness of life because we would have looked into God and said, oh, wait, God, you're better than I know because the enemy's always accusing. Remember, the enemy only has one job. He's the accuser of the brethren and the accuser of God. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He can't help but lie. So everything he's saying, even if it smells of a little bit of truth, is a lie. Even if it contains truth, and I could take you to the scripture that he quoted Jesus, it contained truth, but it was wrong. And the enemy's trying to like say, well, God loves you sometimes, most of the time, or work harder. And he's saying, no, no, that's all a lie. And so he's always accusing. So I want to go back to the first one, though, that you don't have to beg. No need to beg is what I wrote. See, we have to understand that the people in this time frame didn't think God was love and they didn't think he was good. And so even though they knew Jesus was carrying something beautiful from heaven, at this point, Mark 7, they're either he's from God or he's from the devil. And they were, and, and so the ones that were coming to him were like, he's from heaven. But they didn't understand. They hadn't looked into God to realize God is love. Or let's use their phrase, Jehovah is love. Jehovah is good. They thought that he was mad at them. They thought that he was disappointed in them. So their only way to approach was begging. Now, here's what's crazy. We live in a new, better covenant, yet much of our prayer models this approach. It models a begging of God. It models a begging for him to change the circumstance. When my suggestion to you is that he already has and that the answer is already yours and his goodness and his love has already made a way and he's saying, hey, I need people who understand. That's why it says in Hebrews 4, this says, boldly approach the throne of grace, right? To receive grace and mercy. What he's saying is, hey, there's actually something that's already readily available for you, but you got to go after it with confidence. And I don't mean some false confidence. I mean confidence in who Jesus is. I know who God is, and I know he loves me. How many of things you're waiting for in prayer? Yeah? 
How often does God, the enemy attack the foundation of that truth that God doesn't want to give it to you? Daily, right? Hourly, some of you to the minute. The minute you start having confidence that God is going to do it because he's good and he's kind. And it may look different, guys. I just want to say that. It may look a little different because oftentimes we attach our things to it, but it doesn't change the fact God has already looked at you and said, I'm pleased. And I want to show you my love and my kindness and my graciousness, my mercy. The enemy is attacking our confidence. He would love to put us in the old covenant of beg mode. Now I'm going to challenge you. What's your prayer look like? If it's old covenant begging, I want to tell you it's fruitless. Well, it's prayer. Mm, I don't think so. I actually think it's glorified information at the best and complaining at the worst. And God is saying, I don't, I don't want that. I want you to be confident to understand as a son, as a daughter, as an image bearer. You just take on my image and like, no, I know you're good. I know your love. So I'm going to choose goodness and love. I'm going to choose to put it on. And I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to live begging. Number two, that was a miracle. He removes us out of the atmosphere of our pain and disappointment. This is actually not the only time Jesus took someone out of the city, out of the group of friends, out of the group. Even though I, I, it was amazing to me, the friends are the one who come to Jesus, but because of their begging, he had to remove them from them. He's like, we got a better covenant I'm gonna take you into over here. So privately, he takes him away from the crowd. Isn't it interesting that we want most of our things to happen in front of people so we have a guarantee that it happened? And God is like, wait, I wanna, but most importantly, I believe that the town and the connection to it has to do with pain and disappointment. Because sometimes I think we read the scripture and we, we flowery think, oh, it's so beautiful. The deaf and mute man got healed. We have to understand what that guy's look, life looked like. It looked like rejection. It looked like living outside the camp. It looked like coming in and people wanting to stone him. It looked like people judging it looked like people saying, because we know this in John 5, I wonder if he sinned or if his parents sinned. Come on, that's what the scripture says, right? They're judging in all these ways, and this guy's just trying to get a loaf of bread, right? So imagine the trauma in his soul of being deaf mute. It wasn't just that he couldn't hear and talk a little. It was everything the enemy wanted to throw on top of that. Have you noticed the enemy doesn't fight fair? He's like, oh, he's deaf mute. I'm going to let it just lay at that. No, now let's throw on he's a loser and less than. Now let's make it hard to go in the city. Now let's put rejection on him and fear and pain. And now let's let his parents reject him because they don't want the stigma of that. See, that's how the enemy fights. He sees the places that God is wanting to redeem, and he starts pouring it on. And God says, hey, I see everything going on. So he says, come here. Come over here. Come over here. You sit here. No, nope, right here, because this is who you are. He says, this is where you're going to get whole. That over there, it's old. This over here, it's me. It's him. Now I'm just going to take a minute. He's taking you out of that because he wants to give you everything he's promised. So let him take you out. Let him take you out. Like It feels hard. It feels different. Let him take you out because he's got something better. He's got something better. I love you. See, what's it mean? It can look like it's challenging to the places in us. And here's our choice. 
he could have said no. And I believe that oftentimes there's offer for God, like, hey, you want to come out of that? Yeah, Heal me here. No. Heal me now, and I'll tell you how to do it. And it's got, not going to involve spit in my tongue. <laughs> no, really. Jesus just laid hands on some people, some people just with a word, but this guy gets spit in a tongue touch. Why? Because Jesus is not into formula. And if he sees something in your life and it's going to take something radical to get you free, then he'll do it. But you have to be part of the plan. If you haven't noticed that, you're a huge part of the plan. He still values your yes. And when he took that guy by the hand and said, want to come out of the city? I think something, woo, and his spirit went, you bet I do. Yeah. I'm coming with Jesus. And he told the beggars, you stay. I got business with your friend. And then it's interesting. He uses the word be open, and it's the same word in Isaiah 61 that says, you're going to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. It's the same word. He was saying, this isn't about deafness and muteness. It's about prisons. And a lot of us are wanting him to change our situation when he's trying to change your location. Preach, right? He, I just made that up. I didn't even write that down. He wants to change. There's a shoe. He wants to, some of, most of us are praying for us to change our situation and he's wanting to change our location. And I don't mean move houses to a bigger, better house. I mean move to a place of freedom that you've never even dreamt of. Because when Jesus touches your tongue, it turned into a tongue of the word. What's crazy, just a side note, so if you want to know, and we don't know all the reasons. People that act like they know everything Jesus was doing, quit listening to them. They're making stuff up. But in the culture, the firstborn male was considered to have healing virtue in their saliva. And he was just saying, I'm going to show you I'm the firstborn of all men, of second Adam. When he spit, I believe something went in that guy that, whoa, I'm getting free. It's so powerful that one miracle, it doesn't say did any other miracles, brings a place of celebration and joy to the entire region. Listen, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. You say, are they disobeying? I actually think that he was trying to stay incognito, but his mission could not be denied. And so they just, it says, they didn't do a very good job of it. They did the more they did so, the more they kept telling and talking about. People were overwhelmed with amazement. Now, here's where I want to land. Most of us lived overwhelmed in a different way. Have you noticed that there is no word whelmed? Really? I, I, years ago, we started joking about this. Like, there's no word whelmed. It's a neutral sense. Like, I'm feeling whelmed today. What's that mean? Good, bad. Here, there. Hot, cold. You're either overwhelmed or you're underwhelmed. And something happened when Jesus took that guy out of the city and displayed the kingdom of God. It says when he sighed, the word right there means he focused on heaven. Holy moly, Jesus focused on heaven. And all of a sudden, something started happening, and people start getting overwhelmed with the goodness of God in their life from one miracle. It doesn't say they brought many. Many came. Many were healed, even though it says it a ton more times. This time, it's one thing happened. And it says all things are possible. Oh, my shoe's untied. Everybody's pointing at it. I'll tie it. Hey, that gives me an extra minute. All right, last one, because this is what was happening. He makes all things beautiful. They made this declaration, 
He has done everything well. Now, I appreciate the English until it does the translation like this. He's done all things well. It's like when the Cowboys scoring are like, C.D. Lamb has done all things well. No. It sounds, I mean, we, and no wonder the church was so dead. They're like, oh, he's done all things well. There's something in the atmosphere. They're like, oh, my goodness, this is perfection. This is what we've been serving. This is what we've been looking for. This is why we go to the temple. Jesus is here, and he makes all things beautiful is the word it means right there. Now, here's what's interesting. They're actually quoting a verse from the Old Testament. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, I just want to turn there real quick. You can tell I turn here often. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. What's going on? When they quote this verse, they're saying, something's going on in our hearts. Something's happening in our hearts. When Jesus is into me, you see, something starts happening in you. And they're they're basically quoting the verse, eternity's going into us. Eternity's around. Eternity's happening. Only these things happen in a different realm. They're literally saying the kingdom of God is among us. They're saying eternity is here. And that's what starts happening when Jesus starts revealing himself to us. Now, here's my challenge. Can we live overwhelmed? If you, man, I, I have loved Jesus for a long time. But I love him more today than I ever have. And this is the opposite of what every older person told me would happen to me as a young man. They would come and say, you're just young. I love to see that youthful fire. And there used to be something in me. It's like, I got eternity in my heart. I didn't know how to say it like that then, but I knew I felt it. And I would be like, I'm going to the grave in love with Jesus more than I am right now. And there's something in us that should live overwhelmed. That like, oh my goodness, God is here. He's for us. Who can be against us? What started happening in them is they're like praising God against the rules. They're outside the temple. All the rules, all the religion, the beautiful way that that Scott talked about last week of rejecting religion happened in one moment of eternity going in their hearts. Guys, that's why we got to look at Jesus and not get numb to it. Now I want to challenge you. How many have read the gospel and like, that's good? And it not change us. That's why I won't get out of Mark. I want to, guys. I got other stuff brewing around. He's like, Mark. Why? Because he's saying, I want you to look into me. I want, I want you to live the dream of living overwhelmed. Hasn't he made all things beautiful? Over. And over, even when you're in the, I'm just going to say it, the suckiest situation. And you can still look at him and say, man, you make all things beautiful. I heard someone preaching this week. I'm going to be super careful here. But basically, they were breaking down that God works all things for good for those who love him. And they put some qualifications of how we get there. Well, there's some that they reached for. But I just want to tell you that God does all things beautiful. And here's the funny thing. We got to look back at them and we have areas in our life that are a mess. He wants us to open up. 
and say, yeah, it was messy and it caused pain, disappointment, destruction. How have you done some things that caused some destruction? He said, no, I want to look into you and I want to make all things beautiful. Let me tell you what it's not, complicated. It's not complicated. Just a crowd of people watching Jesus be Jesus. Next thing you know, eternity is going in their heart. It doesn't say they came with the desire to believe in Jesus even more than the day before. It just says they came to see him. Come on. Got a baby coming up the front aisle. So here's what we're going to do. I, I, I gained my minute, so I'm going to have you stand. Now I want to remind you, the father had a dream, and now we're living in it. The father had a dream, and you are now living in it. Whether you are a believer or you're a pre-believer, and today's your day. So how do I have the intimacy with God? You have to believe him. You have to believe in him, that Jesus was the son of God that he came to take away the sins of the world, that he came to love you and remove your sin, make you clean. So if that's you today, we're gonna have some prayer teams up there about to announce. We'd love for you to come up, give your life to Jesus. Say, what's that mean? It means you just say, I believe. And everywhere I don't believe, Lord, would you change me? And if you wanna add more to salvation than that, you're wrong. But for the rest of us who are pursuers, lovers of Jesus, giving our lives for it, are we living overwhelmed? He makes all things beautiful. So here's what I want everyone to do. I rarely do this. I want everyone to close your eyes. We're going to get real here for a minute. This is called ministry corporate style. I want you to pick one place in your life that you don't like to go to because it doesn't feel beautiful. Some of you is divorce. Some of you is childhood trauma. Some of you, and and I'm not trying to dig it up. We're about to make it beautiful. God doesn't give us trauma to heal our trauma. It doesn't have to be big. It could just be something that replays in your mind. You're like, that's so little. I don't know why it replays. Maybe someone's saying something to you. I had the Lord take me somewhere in a swimming pool when I was seven years old recently. He said, remember when that kid said something to you? I was like, yeah. Say, how often do you think of it? I was like, a lot. I make all things beautiful. It was just a kid being a kid. So if when you get that spot, I want you to raise your hand. Some of you, I'm just going to get real. You've just put it in your failure category and won't go there. And it's time to raise your hand so we can move it to the other category of beautiful. I got my hand up. I'm preaching to myself. Now I prophesy he makes all things beautiful. I prophesy it. So let him move categories. He works all things for good. He makes all things beautiful. He loves me. He never rejects me, never leaves me, never forsakes me. We just welcome the eternity of heaven in here right now. Come on, let your heart be open. Pull that heart open because his heart's open right now. Into me you see. Into me you see. If you feel like running right now, that's him saying, I want to take you out of your prison. If you feel like, I don't like this guy. Let me get out of here. It's not me. It's the enemy lying to you once you stay in your prison. I say to your cell, be open. Be open. Be open.
Let's go outside the city. Free of judgment, free of pain, free of disappointment. Father, we thank you that we live in your kingdom culture, and it's a culture of dreams and fulfilled dreams. Dreams and fulfilled dreams. Back to the question I asked earlier, how many have a dream in your heart that you know God has put there? I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up again. Now I wanted to tell you that he is a fulfiller of dreams. Now I want everyone to look at me. He's a fulfiller of dreams. He's a fulfiller of dreams. He's a fulfiller of dreams. He is a fulfiller of dreams because he created the culture. All right, I'm going to end with this. Last night I was here praying and just waiting for something to say. And the Lord dropped something in my heart for someone. And I didn't know that it's Kathleen's birthday today. But last night, the Lord spoke to me about you. Just sitting in there, he's like, I want you to prophesy over Kathleen tomorrow. And then I got home, Liz goes, it's Kathleen's birthday tomorrow. I was like, oh, that's good, I got something. <laughs> and I heard the Lord say, I'm turning your milestones into diamonds. And I saw him going back to milestones in your life that were good and you knew they were good and there were flags and they were celebrating, yay, but they didn't feel beautiful to you. And the Lord, I saw him, it was like these stones and all of a sudden they started turning into like precious stones. Really, they were diamonds, but they were different colors even. And he was going back to different places, milestones in your life. And, and he was just making them precious stones. And what I heard, he said, I'm about to journey with her to just for joy in the past. And then I could look forward and see all these milestones in your life. And they were stunningly beautiful. And you just had joy knowing they were coming. You had joy that you were going to get to look at them, celebrate them, draw them, redraw them, give them to people, break off little pieces and hand them to people and say, this is what it looked like in my life. And the Lord just says, I am taking future, present, and past milestones, and I'm turning them into diamonds. And so, and it's your birthday. (laughs) But I just want to say this now. This is obviously from the Lord because it's a truth. But there's many things here that happen because of Kathleen. She's a creator of a lot of our dreams. We say, like, here's an idea, and she makes it happen. And so we see that. This room sees that. Good job, guys. We see you. Come on, there's legacy standing right here. I just want to say yes to what God's done in her life. But we want to express our gratitude. And just know that you are seen, you are loved, and you are known here. We know you as beautiful. We know you as known. So we just bless you guys right now. Christian, come on out here. I mean, everybody just lift their hands. It's just been too good to just go out of here without something a little bit wild. Yeah. Eternity's in the room. We're going to come back and worship tonight. The Cowboys are going to be so far ahead that it won't matter at 6 p.m. Lord, you hear my cry.